Hi, everyone. Welcome in. We'll begin in a moment. We'll let everyone get settled. Hi, everyone. Thank you for coming tonight. Um, we are recording this webinar and um, we are really excited to have this, these incredible guests. My name is Kiyomi Kowalski. I uh, chair the Social Justice Collective at Valley Outreach Synagogue. The Social Justice Collective contains three initiatives and one of those initiatives is against anti-Semitism. Um, we will be meeting later the chair of the Against Anti-Semitism Task Force, Robin Weber. Um, but for now, I want to thank our incredibly generous sponsors, the USC Kasdan Institute, um, AJC, Zahor Holocaust Remembrance Foundation. Um, this is such a critical conversation at a really critical time, and um, it, this conversation couldn't come soon enough. So we're gonna start with a short uh, video that I will share. And I don't think I shared the sound, so that's a problem. Let me stop the sharing one second. All right, now we're cooking with gas, everybody. grave mistake to view anti-Semitism as something that merely affects the Jewish people. Anti-Semitism is a form of discrimination against citizens that affects all of us. You do see anti-Semitism correlating with an intolerance generally. That is fundamentally going to constitute a threat to the kind of discourse and tolerance that are the bedrock of our democracies. Historians of anti-Semitism have long argued that anti-Semitism, it begins with the Jews, but it never ends with the Jews. It transcends place. It transcends nationality. We can document anti-Semitic attacks through the Middle Ages, and we can document them certainly in the 20th century, and now we can document them in the 21st century. It has legs that I think other hatreds haven't had. Unfortunately, we are facing in Europe, all over Europe, a very strong resurgence of anti-Semitism. Anti-Semitism today is fundamentally different than what it was before the Holocaust, because it is not perpetrated by governments. Even if some of the stereotypes and prejudice are those we know for centuries. The 
problem is that in our Muslim communities in Europe, uh, we have a few thousands of radicalized youth. These jihadists are rapidly anti-Semitic. We never know whether they are going to cross the red line of terrorism, and some do. Often their targets are Jewish institutions or Jews. We see across Europe an increase of right-wing extremist parties. These parties are not anymore considered as being on the fringe of societies. And their messages, their ideologies, are more and more seen as something that is acceptable. Sometimes it's camouflaged by, we don't want those who are different, a general anti-immigrant, anti-minority view. You have, as well, a new form of anti-Semitism that is closely linked with anti-Zionism and hostility towards Israel. There is legitimate criticism of the policies of Israel, but there is a fine line that some people cross very easily between criticism of Israel and anti-Semitism. Where it gets very problematic is when one starts to hear that the state of Israel doesn't have the right to exist. When one starts to hear Israelis or Israel itself being demonized and the concerted effort to delegitimate the state and the people, that is anti-Semitism. I think that most of the anti-Semitism in the Middle East is misinformed. It is to group people against a common enemy. Holocaust denial is a form of anti-Semitism. The only reason to deny the Holocaust is to inculcate and foster anti-Semitism. One place where hardcore denial is very much in vogue is in the Middle East. The audience often are anti-Semites who are looking to have their feelings confirmed, or people who might not be overt anti-Semites, but somehow are discomforted with the idea of Jew as victim. I think for anyone, anti-Semitism should be an important topic and subject. If it's going on in Pakistan, it should be important to someone living in Kansas City. We are a connected global community. If you leave anti-Semitism unresponded to by law enforcement, by governments, by political leaders, then you send this message that it's tolerated, that it's completely accepted. What you're seeing now is states, at least in, in Europe, where there's been the biggest upsurge, seeking to combat those crimes. More needs to be done. We'll stand together against discrimination against minority, with Christians, or anti-Semitism. We'll stand together shoulder to shoulder because our religion, all of us, call us to stand as one family. It is extremely important that parts of our society that aren't themselves being targeted by anti-Semitism see this as a warning. When anti-Semitic discrimination or violent acts happen, it is a threat to liberal society, and citizens around the world have an interest in thwarting it and in speaking out against it. Recent threats targeting Jewish community centers and vandalism of Jewish cemeteries, as well as last week's shooting in Kansas City, remind us that we are a country that stands united in condemning hate and evil in all of its very ugly forms. There's a well-worn tradition in most societies of marginalizing the other. Xenophobia, Islamophobia, anti-Semitism starts as rhetoric, very quickly migrates to discrimination and can result in violence. It is extremely important that parts of our society that aren't themselves being targeted by anti-Semitism see this as a warning. When anti-Semitic discrimination or violent acts happen, it is a threat to liberal society.
Welcome, and thank you for joining us today for this moving program. I'm Robin Weber, Communications Director of the Zahor Holocaust Remembrance Foundation and member of the Valley Outreach Synagogue. I am also honored to chair the Against Anti-Semitism Task Force for our community at VOS. Please feel free to use the Q&A box located at bottom of screen for any questions you may have during our Q&A portion of this event. Today, in 2021, we can do things most of us would never have imagined just a few years ago, including all of us gathering tonight virtually to learn. And yet, some things haven't changed. Recent evidence is overwhelming. Hatred and anti-Semitism are flourishing. Whether we recognize it or not, millions of Jews are confronted with various forms of hatred. Hate is a strong emotion, a mental venom that is not, if not treated, can poison the relationships and communities around you. I believe that education is the gateway to prevention. Teaching the lessons of the past, including the origins of Nazism and anti-Semitism, gets to the root of the seeding hatred and the differences of labeling and stereotyping to prevent the growth from within. According to ADL, within the last year, there have been over 7,500 incidents of extremism or anti-Semitic attacks in the United States. Sadly, 63% of American Jews feel their communities are less safe than they were a decade ago. Why is that? And we'll get to that in just a moment. It is our goal to inform and recognize what is happening in and around us and what we as a community, our community can do to stop it from spreading. But before we do, let me tell you a little about Zahor and what I do. Zahor means remember. We are dedicated to spreading awareness to never forget and never again. Our mission is to preserve the memory of the Holocaust through a myriad of educational tools and outreach programs. Because when we educate, we prevent and in turn promote tolerance. It may be one man's story, but his story of adversary, adversary, mm, adversity excuse me, teaches the values of acceptance and peace to many. There's no better time than now our future depends on it. Let me share with you a little something about our, our organization and the man behind it. It's human nature to want to live. is at stake any minute you could be killed. You lived from minute to minute and, and, and prayed a lot and hoped that nothing will happen to you. Nazis did not start with killing, they started with hate. Once love and respect was eradicated by hate, it was easy to kill. I have dedicated my life to end this hatred. When we educate, we can prevent, and then we will ultimately prevail. Never Forget is the driving force behind the Zahor Holocaust Remembrance Foundation. We are dedicated to ensuring the remembrance of the Holocaust with community building efforts designed to guide positive change. Our mission is to make sure the Holocaust never happens again. Education is the gateway to prevention. And we provide tools for curriculum-based Holocaust studies, which teaches the virtues of perseverance, all while promoting peace and acceptance. It's possible to let tragedy or trauma become a reason to stop living. 
but it's also possible to live through extreme circumstances and commit to a life that has meaning, a life that matters. your support to continue our mission through educational programs, events, and awareness to never again. To learn more about our organization, please visit ZahorFoundation.org. Tonight, we are honored to have three amazing guests who will take us on a journey from one man's experience of hate, followed by what we can do to prevent. I welcome Ben Lesser, Holocaust survivor, author, lecturer, family man, and my grandfather, Ben Lesser. I also welcome Dr. Michael Berenbaum, scholar, author, filmmaker, and the director of the Ziggy Ziering Institute an organization that studies and educates about the Holocaust and its continued impact today. He's also the historian for the Academy Award-winning documentary by Steven Spielberg, The Last Days. Our distinguished moderator for the evening is Dr. Saba Samuk. Dr. Samuk has devoted her life to the study of world religions and helping people create peace instead of conflict. She is an award-winning author and scholar who is currently the associate director for the Human Rights Organization for American Jewish Committee in Los Angeles. Thank you all three for joining us tonight. And without any further ado, I introduce my grandfather, Ben Lesser of the Zafar Foundation. Thank you, Robin. That was a nice introduction. Yes, my friends, I come to you from an era in history where civilization lost its humanity, its heart. A time when there were only three kinds of people in this world. There were the killers, the victims, and the bystanders. Imagine, it turns out that we now know that the whole world knew what was happening to the Jewish people. And they decided to keep silent, giving Hitler carte blanche to do with the Jewish people anything you wish. And he did. He did just that. Six million of us, a million and a half of whom were children. You know, when we talk about six million, to most of us, it's a big number. We know it's a lot of people. But we can't imagine. So I'll illustrate this to you. If you were to take six million people, lay them down head to toe, they would stretch from Washington, D.C. to San Francisco and back again. Another example, Dallas Football Stadium is the biggest stadium in the world, and it holds 85,000 people. Imagine 70 Dallas football stadiums full of people, slaughtered, killed. I mean, we talk about these high numbers and it goes in and out, but each one of those people was a friend, a relative, a living human being, just like you and me. We can't just put them under a number. That's something that the Nazis did. Because it was hard to kill a person that had a name, but with a number, it didn't matter. You were not human, just killing a number. Anyway, I get carried away whenever the subject comes up. 
I want to tell you a little bit about my background. I was born in Krakow, Poland in 1928. So when the war broke out, I was just about 11, not quite 11, one month shy of 11 years old. And I lived in Krakow, which was a lovely city. And uh, being a child, I guess I never experienced anti-Semitism because I probably never mingled with other nationalities than Jewish. I went to Heider, I went to Yeshiva, I went to all, all our own people. But the irony is I don't remember any of this. It all skipped my mind. I don't remember going to school, to Heider, going to, having friends, I, any of my teachers, all of this was blocked out from my mind by the Holocaust. So the good years of my life disappeared. And I heard a lot of stories from my older sister and such that I had a beautiful life as a child, but all disappeared. The bad years just wiped out the good years. So in Krakow, it was a great city. My mother's side of the family comes from Munkaj, used to be Czechoslovakia, but then during the war it was Hungary. In 1938, it was annexed to Hungary. So every year my mother would take us kids to go to her side of the family to Munkaj in the summer. We would spend the whole summer with her side of the family. In the winter time, we would come back to Krakow, go to school or whatever. And, and uh, we had a wonderful life, actually like two different homes. But I just get flashes about the house in Munkaj. It was a stately mansion, unbelievable. Um, certain, certain flashes come back to me, but I don't remember everything about it. Um, but from the day the war broke out, September of 1939, I remember every, every item that happened to me. Why? Why? I would love to remember those sweet years that I had, but it's not there. And I doubt at my age it will now come back. I doubt it very much. So I'm living in Krakow, and this was the war suddenly broke out, and we heard fighting was near. Uh, the other side of, of Poland, and Krakow was still safe. But a few days later, early in the morning, around 5 a.m., the whole building started to shake and rattle. And we lived in a three-story apartment house. And this whole building started, I never experienced an earthquake. So I ran to the window to see what's going on. And I look out the window and I see tanks are rolling down the street. We lived on a major thoroughfare. After the tanks, they were half tracks. And every few steps, a soldier would jump out of the half track, get on the sidewalk, and this is how they occupied the city. But there was no fighting or anything. Following the half tracks, they were the Wehrmacht, the foot soldier, with the shiny black boots and the goose steps. It was quite impressionable for 11 year old kid. But we kids didn't know what to expect. We didn't know what, what to expect. But right after that procession, my father calls us kids into the dining room, tells us to sit down on chairs, and he tells us, okay, from this day on, there are no more kids. You're all adults. You're gonna to listen to what we tell you 
you're not going to um, complain. And everything we tell you, you will be doing from now on. Remember, no more whining or crying. You're now all adults. I remember what happened. And, and he was telling us this, and we, we, we just know that we were being occupied and nothing was happening. But on the fifth day, early in the morning, around 5 a.m., a truck pulls up to the gate and soldiers in the truck started to bang on the gate. And when the super came running out with his shirt tail hanging out, well, what's going on? What's going on? All they wanted to know where the Jewish people live. Juden. That's all they wanted to know. And he was quick to oblige. He said, oh, this one family, he pointed to us. And on the other side of the building, on the ground floor, in the same flo floor, there was another Jewish family. It was a three-story building but only on the ground floor we occupied to Jewish family. The other family had a young couple and they had two daughters about a little younger than me. And the mother gave birth to an infant little boy about two months earlier. They came breaking down the door and pistol whipping us while we were still in bed. And in their hands, they had sex, open sex, and they were screaming, throw in all your valuables, money, gold, silver, whatever they can find of value, uh, silverware, everything was thrown in there. And they're beating up my father to open up the safe. While my father is opening the safe, we hear this terrible screaming from our neighbor's apartment. My sister Lola and I, uh, the Lola is the one who survived the war. Uh, and I went through the back door from our kitchen and we went out to the yard and to their kitchen door and we came in and this is what we saw. We saw this monster was holding the infant by its legs and swinging it and yelling to the parents, make him shut up. The parents and the daughters were yelling, our baby, our baby, don't hurt our baby. With a smirk on his face, you can see he was enjoying what he was doing. He smashes the baby's head into the doorpost, killing it instantly. It's a sight I can never forget. The screaming infant and that sudden silence and to see what, what came out of his head unbelievable. It just won't leave me and it's with me constantly and I'm, I made peace with it. I know it's not, never going to leave me. Anyway, we all jumped on this monster, the parents and even I and my sister and the two daughters, we all jumped on him. We threw him down. We were beating him up. And when the other soldiers heard something was going on, they came running in and they saw what was going on. They couldn't believe it. I don't think that they have even seen anything like this, an infant being killed against the door with the open, uh, unbelievable. So he says, come on, Hans, let's go, let's go. They gathered up all their valuables, threw it in a sack threw it in the truck and took off, took off. Now this was the fifth day after occupation. But this was only the beginning of what's coming. You can't believe the ordinances that started to come in fast and furious. There was curfew. You couldn't go out from seven to seven. You had to be in the houses. You had to wear a Star of David. Uh, we had to change our IDs and there should be a big J in the ID for you there, Jewish. Um, things started to happen. And the strange thing is for the Jewish people, there were no judges, no juries, not even prisons at that time. 
if you were caught disobeying any of their ordinances, there was only one punishment for the Jewish people. They shot you on the street. There was no accountability. Imagine. And every morning there were people going around picking up these dead bodies. But this was just the beginning. And new ordinances came in said the Jewish people can no longer reside in Krakow. They made one exception. They never did that before. They gave us a choice. If you want to live in Krakow, you have to go inside the ghetto. They were making a ghetto. Now, if you youngsters don't know what a ghetto is, I hope that your teachers will be able to describe it to you. It was a horrible place. You, uh, you can't imagine what living was living and dying was like in a ghetto. Anyway, but they gave us the choice. You can either go into the ghetto or you can go to a small community neighboring Krakow, but you can't live in a big city. My sister Lola, she was a beautiful girl anyway. Both of my sisters were beauties. And Lola had a young man who was who was crazy in love with her. And he was after her. And he comes to my father and he says, Mr. Lesser, you know how I feel about Lola. Someday I'd love to marry her, but do me a favor. Come to the same community that my family is moving to. And my father gave him a choice to go into the ghetto or small community, obviously he went along. And Michael, my future brother-in-law, made all the arrangements. He hired a wagon and a driver and a horse and buggy. And anyway, from this point on, by the way, I didn't tell you. I didn't tell you what happened to the picture. Okay. My father's business was wine and syrup. He had the wine and syrup factory, kosher wine and syrup. And he also had a chocolate factory. He was the first one who manufactured chocolate covered wafers in Europe. He went to his wine and syrup factory one day and there were guards stationed. They just chased him away, confiscated. He went to the chocolate factory the same way. There were guards stations, confiscated. All I can tell you, my father was not the same person. Whenever he comes home from the chocolate factory, us kids would search his pockets and find that some sweets and candies. We would, you know, and he always made sure he had some in his pocket. But this time he came back, we couldn't recognize him. No candy, no chocolate, and he set us all down and he told us what happened all his businesses. The man worked all his life to, to build up a business to, to support the family. And just like that, it's taken away, just like that. Ben? Yeah. Um, I know you had to, you left, you made the choice to leave Poland, the whole family. And then you were, in, you spent the next um, couple of years pretty much in hiding, moving from one town to another. Do you think you could mention about um, the time that the, with the raid and where you were yes. in hiding? Yes, Gail. Yes, I'll skip. Anyway, a lot of things were happening. We were running from town to town going and, and, and avoiding these raids. Wherever we went, somehow we found out a day before, a few hours before, and we were lucky to get away. And we were in this small town where Michael moved us to um, in a farmhouse and we lived there. And about the, meanwhile, Lola and Michael got married. They moved out of the house. My oldest brother got married, moved out of the house. And now we're, Michael is living in, a, in an apartment building it was a duplex. One side was the owner of the duplex who happened to be the mayor of that community of Nepalomitsa. So 
one day he comes home, he says, Michael, Lola, save yourselves. I heard there's going to be a rumor against, the, I mean, a raid against the Jewish people, either tonight or tomorrow night. So when Michael heard it, he hired the wagon, a driver, and in the middle of the night, we snuck out the whole family and we got a, and the only place we could go was to a city called Bochnia. Bochnia had a ghetto. That meant we had to go into the ghetto. But Bochnia ghetto had a very bad reputation. And people were warned, stay away from that ghetto. Why? Every so often, two or three dump trucks would come into the, to the ghetto in the middle of the night. And the Nazis would go from house to house pull out the children from their beds and throw them into the dump truck. You can imagine the parents screaming for their children, the children screaming for their parents. They filled up two or three dump trucks. They started to pull out of the ghetto. Obviously, the parents were running behind these trucks and screaming for their children. But these cultured people had machine guns at the end of each truck. And as the parents were running behind these trucks, they would open the machine guns and mow them down in front of their children. No one ever heard of these kids. You can just imagine what happened to them. Now, but we had no choice. We had to go into this ghetto. Living in this ghetto was unbelievable. To give you an example, they put us in, they put my father, my mother, my little brother, and myself into an apartment with eight other people. So now we were 12. It's not an apartment, we're just one big room. And the room had a stove, a, a, a ice box, and it had boxes for chairs, uh, broken down furniture. But there was one piece of furniture that was outstanding. I didn't pay attention to it place where you play, where you hang your coats and jackets. It was ornate, it was different. It didn't quite fit into that, uh, to that ensemble of furniture. But I didn't pay attention to it. I had to work inside the ghetto. My job was working um, into a uniform, in a uniform factory sewing on buttons. And I was about almost 13 years old. It was an easy enough job, but 13 hours a day with very little food. food. Anyway, one day, um, this, this inside the ghetto, they had Jewish policemen. They had a Jewish police station. They had no weapons. Their job was to keep order inside the ghetto. One of these Jewish policemen who knew my brother-in-law, Michael, they went to school together, to yeshiva together. He says, Michael, save yourselves. I heard there's going to be a raid tonight. Well, ever since those trucks would come in the middle of the night and pull out the kids from the bed, every apartment and every house had a hiding place. They called them bunkers. That's when I found out our bunker that we are, was this ornate piece of furniture. As you open the door, you push the clothing apart, the back panel would slide apart, and there was a hole in the wall, and the 12 of us could crawl through that hole and stand between two buildings. Fortunately for us, the outside of the buildings were connected. The roofs were open and all night long we heard shooting, dogs barking, screaming, yelling. We heard our neighbors being torn apart by these vicious dogs. Towards morning it got quiet. When it got quiet, we dared to come out. And when we came out, we went outside, we couldn't believe what our eyes have seen. Dead people laying in the snow all over, mothers with their infants torn apart by wild dogs. And there were people going around in push carts, picking up these bodies and pieces of bodies and put them in the push carts and then taking them to the ghetto square. And these cultured people would come with gasoline cans, pour gasoline over them 
and start a human bonfire in Bochnia Ghetto Square. Well, Ben, I'm going to interrupt okay. real quick. You know, yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm Gail Lesser Gerber, Ben's daughter. And one of the things that I remember, you know, staying on our theme of anti Semitism is I remember uh, you telling me about some of your first signs that you didn't know it was what it was. You, you just knew that some people hated you. And when you were young, and um, maybe on a Sunday, you would make sure to walk. Can you tell us about if you were walking by a church or something, um, what that That'd was like? Fun. There are so many things that you're yeah. so many parts and miracles to your story. It's just incredible. We'd love to be able to share it tonight. But I think if you could mention about your first taste sure. of this anti-Semitism at a young boy, and then um, we'll, mm -hmm. and then they'll be able to move on from there. Actually, I'm so sorry to do this. We actually have to move on because we have other panelists here. And Grandpa, your story is so riveting. There's so many moving parts to your story. And I know that there are probably a lot of people here on tonight that want to hear it. And there will definitely be a time in which we can get into it um, and really go into the greater details. But I think the idea here, and you've already done it, is you really gave us that taste of your first taste of Nazi barbarism and how it felt to be um, discriminated against. And um, you, you may have not known that it was uh, anti-Semitic at the time because you were so young, but looking back at it today, it is definitely um, an anti-Semitic attack against you and all the other Jews in a systemic way in Europe. And from that, I thank you so much for sharing that with us, Grandpa. And with that, I'd like to bring in Michael Berenbaum to give us the history. I do, I do just like to add a couple items. Uh, most people don't know that I actually went through two Holocausts. Somehow we got out of this ghetto, and that's a story in itself. And I took, we took about 40 or 50 people with us. We were Bosnia ghetto. We were able to escape it, and we wound up eventually in Hungary. And Hungary was a free country in 1943. That's where my oldest sister is. My my mother's side of the family were all waiting there for me, and uh, we had a wonderful life for a few months. And then, of course, the Nazis came in in March of 1944, and the whole thing started all over again and they took me to Auschwitz. And I had to get this in. Dr. Michael Virenbaum, I'm sorry. It's all you, Michael. First of all, Ben, never, never apologize. I can listen to you for a very long time. Okay. I'm gonna do the following. Um, I'm gonna suggest um, two frameworks for understanding the Holocaust very quickly and give the uh, participants uh, a framework to understand what happened. And I'm gonna do it in code language. I'm gonna share my screen for a second and um, have you uh, begin to understand it. There was, uh, if you wanna know what the Germans did, and remember when you deal with the history of the Holocaust, you have two histories. You have uh, the history of the perpetrator, the history of the victim, and as Ben said, you also have the history of the bystander. The great uh, Holocaust scholar, Raul Hilberg, who was one of the first, said you really need to know six words. I can put these into single words, but I did, a, did it a little bit more uh, simply to use English words. You need to know that the process of murdering Jews went through six stages. Definition, expropriation, concentration, but don't think yet of concentration camps, mobile killing units and death camps. And on the right, you see deportation. And I'll explain that for a moment. Hitler came to power telling the world what he intended to do. And telling the world what he intended to, he made that clear as early as 1924 and 25 
by saying that he had a double goal. He had a goal of German expansionism and then German racial theory, which was to create the master race. And the master race had a whole range of inferior races. And one group of people whom he called a race, namely the Jewish people, he regarded as a cancer on German society who had to be eliminated. And we'll see that the definition of eliminated changed over a period of time. When he came to power, a whole range of anti-Semitic incidents took place, a good deal of persecution. But there was a problem. If you intend to persecute a population, you have to understand who that population is. And therefore, the first stage for Hilberg was definition. You had to define the Jew. That was done in 1935 by something called the Nuremberg Laws, which defined the Jews in a way that was unprecedented based on the religion of their grandparents, which meant that you had the bizarre situation where Roman Catholic priests Roman Catholic nuns, Protestant ministers, my own professor of Protestant theology, who was the son of a non-Jew, but the grandson of a Jew, were defined as Jews. Between 1933 and 1939, you had something called e expropriation. We can call it disemancipation. We can call it the introduction of apartheid and segregation. We can call it systematic persecution. Jews were excluded from becoming German citizens, citizens of the country in which they lived, in which they previously were citizens. They were excluded. They were, their financial resources were taken. The idea was to make it impossible for Jews to live as Jews. Therefore, they would leave. There were two problems with that strategy. The first problem is nobody was willing to take the Jews in the numbers in which they had to leave. And the second is that Hitler's first goal of expansionism in a very different way, his expansionism meant that everywhere he went, more and more Jews became incorporated into the Reich. Let's take three simple examples. March 1938, the Germans march into Austria between 1933 and 1938, 150,000 Jews had left Germany. When the Germans marched into Austria, 200,000 Jews came under German control. When they marched into Czechoslovakia, which was then dismembered in September of 1938, 90,000 Jews came into their control. When they invaded Poland, in 1939, and Poland was divided between the Soviet Union and Soviet occupation and German occupation, all of a sudden another 2 million Jews came under, the, under their control. Therefore, it was no longer possible to get rid of the Jews by forced, by forced um, emigration, making it impossible for them to live as Jews. The next stage then became concentration, but not yet concentration camps. We can call that ghettoization. And the ghettos had two different functions. And if you listen to Ben carefully, you'll understand that. For Jews, it was a way of life until. For Germans, it was a way to contain and control the Jews, to get rid of them from non-Jewish space until. Neither side began understanding until what, and in retrospect it becomes clear. The Jews believed that it would be until Germany came to incensus, until Germany was defeated, until the world had come to rescue them, and for the Germans it was until two things happened. The decision was made as to what to do with the Jews, and the infrastructure was built for their decimation, for their annihilation, what the Germans used in their language for their extermination. The infrastructure that was built was the death camps. But before that, a new type, uh, and remember to concentrate the Jews, to bring them together, you had to deport them from small towns, villages, and hamlets to larger towns, larger ghettos. 
and you had to control them there. The killing of Jews began in 1941, in June 22nd, 1941. And this is where the Holocaust takes on a very unique and distinct dimension, unprecedented in human history. The first stage of killing was to take the perpetrators, the killers, and bring them to the Jews. The Germans introduced 3,000 Einsatzgruppen, special mobile killing units that came in. They did not work alone. They worked with local gendarmerie. They worked with the army, with the Wehrmacht, and even with the Hungarian and the um, Romanian army. They also worked with local anti-Semites who killed their own Jews who were natives. So for example, in Lithuania, two out of three Jews were killed not by Germans, but by Lithuanians. In Latvia, about four as six out of 10 were killed by Latvians, not Germans. And in Estonia, 10 out of 10, 100% of the Jews were killed by Estonians. And several years ago, a man by the name of Jan Gross published a book called Neighbors, discussing what happened in one Polish town, but it happened in many. The town was Jadwavne, and neighbors essentially killed neighbors because they wanted not only to murder them, but to inherit their property. And once they inherited their property, they essentially didn't want the Germans to take it from them, so they killed their own Jews. Mobile killing became enormously difficult for the perpetrators. It's very hard apparently to get up in the morning to go out and kill men, women, and children all day. They needed drinks at the end of their day, but they soon needed drinks during the middle of the day and at the beginning of the day to quell whatever qualms they might have. There were mental breakdowns and there even was an accusation made by one of the leaders who said to his superior, look in the eyes of these men, what are we creating a nation of savages and neurotics? And then something very dramatic happened, which was to make the Holocaust possible in all of its dimensions, which is the metaphor changed or the modality changed. And instead of taking, making the killers mobile and the victims stationary, they transformed the victims and made them mobile and sent them to stationary killing centers, which ultimately became factories of death. The idea is that at first they sent the killers to the victims. Then when that proved too difficult, they switched it around. They made the victims mobile. They sent them to stationary killing centers, which essentially operated on the principle of a factory of death which produced an end product of dead Jews whose bodies then were cremated, but also whose basic physicality, all that they possessed, even the hair on the head, the gold in their mouths, even their ashes were used and recycled to funnel into the Nazi war economy. Let's use an example and statistics will tell you the nature of the example. A death camp by the name of Belgitz, which was the second of the death camps to come online, operated for 10 months between February and December 1942. It killed 500,000 Jews in 10 months, virtually all the Jews of Galicia. It had a staff of 104, of whom 14 were Germans. It ceased operation in December 1942 because there were no more Jews in the vicinity in order to kill. Treblinka, which uh, some of you have been to, Treblinka was a death camp located about uh, 60 miles from Warsaw, operating between the uh, 23rd of July uh, 1942 and the 4th of August 1943 killing 925,000 Jews, ultimately burning and consuming their bodies, with a staff of 120 of whom 90 were Ukrainians and 30 were SS. So in that case, you see that 1.4 million Jews 
were killed by a total of 44 Germans, aided by 180 Ukrainians, because the process became virtually automated and the murder became a death process, a killing process. What made Auschwitz Auschwitz essentially was the fact that Auschwitz was three camps in one. Auschwitz I was a Polish concentration camp. Auschwitz II was a death camp like Treblinka and Sobibor and, and Belgium's only more efficient. And Auschwitz III made use of labor, slave labor. It was essentially called Buna Manowitz, and it was a place in which German corporations invested 900, uh, 700 million Reichsmarks, 400 million 1942 dollars in the industries because they believed that, that slavery would be a permanent part of the Nazi war economy. So if you're looking at the structure of what happened, you begin to see this is the framework of what happened, an unprecedented modality of death. What was its motivation? And here I'm going to just say a word about anti-Semitism, which will help us in what we're going to discuss in the future. And that is that anti-Semitism varies according to source. Is it social anti-Semitism? Is it political anti-Semitism? It is, is it economic anti-Semitism? Is it religious anti-Semitism? In the Nazi case, it was something unique. It was racial anti-Semitism. Their goal was to eliminate all Jews everywhere because they felt the Jews were essentially a cancer on the German body politic, a cancer which infiltrated them and consequently they had to be eradicated. Anti-Semitism varies not only according to source, but it varies according to goal. If it's political anti-Semitism, your goal is to diminish Jewish political power and the ultimate goal may even be to expel the Jews expulsion from the territories in which they dwell. If your goal is social anti-Semitism, then you want to exclude the Jews from your social context. If your goal is economic anti-Semitism, then you essentially want to limit the economic possibilities of Jews. If your goal is religious anti-Semitism, then what you're fundamentally interested in is conversion. But the Nazis' goal was, was what we call uh, racial anti-Semitism, and Jewish scholars or uh, scholars of anti-Semitism have said that there were two dimensions to that. Saul Friedlander called it redemptive anti-Semitism, meaning that the murder of the Jews the murder of the Jews was essential to the national salvation of the German people. And a man by the name of uh, Tim Snyder, who's written uh, two very important books on the murder in Eastern Europe, and he wrote The Black Earth, which is the story of the Holocaust as he sees it, called it zoological anti-Semitism, which is to essentially transform the nature of the human species by eliminating the Jews. Let me just give you a second framework in, in, in 30 seconds uh, in which you see the origin, of anti, the origin of the Holocaust. And the origin of the Holocaust becomes interesting in our society because we're asking the question, how does a democratic society become authoritarian and totalitarian? How does anti-Semitism get a hold? And essentially what you have then is a mosaic, which is Jewish life before the Nazis in power in which they use their power to dominate, to destroy all forms of opposition. And then they use their power to define, segregate, isolate, and ultimately destroy the Jews, the violence, and then the Jews, even though they were powerless, had essentially a couple of things that they could do, which were very important. The first is early on, they could escape and leave. And the question is, when is the situation so bad that you must leave? Henry Kissinger once said that when his parents left Germany in 1938, it took no foresight, merely opportunity. 
You then had the war, and war allows a whole range of things to take place. War is the, what shall we say, it's the fog of war that allows other radical things to take place. That then led to the ghettos in Poland, to the murder by bullets, and then to a decision that was taken at Wannsee in 1942, which is to change the direction of killing from mobile killers uh, uh, to stationary victims, to, to mobile victims and stationary killers. We can talk about resistance and rescue, which were the alternatives. Hiding was an alternative. And then ultimately you had deportation to death camps where the goal was annihilation. The Nazi term for that was extermination. Few survived and Ben is one of the precious few who not only survived, but was young enough. And then he went on a death march and the death march was a forced evacuation from territories that were gonna be liberated early on by the Soviet army into territories deep within Germany. The Jews called that the death marches. Liberation, which for the Jews was a bittersweet experience. One survivor put it, we had learned to fear death. And now we also understood that we feared life. Another survivor said, for the first time we began to feel and the moment we began to feel was the moment in which we had to confront the dramatic nature of the loss. The world then dealt with judgment. How do you rebuild in the aftermath of such destruction? Nuremberg was one form of such judgment, which was the attempt to rebuild the scaffolding of justice. And then the final stage of that is the return from death onto life. And what we've seen in Ben and his fellow survivors is that they not only rebuilt their own lives, but they transformed their memory into a mission to bear witness, not to undo the past, but in the deep and profound hope that they could transform the future. Let's leave it there, Saba, and turn it back to you. Thank you so much, Mr. Berenbaum, Mr. Lesser, Dr. Berenbaum. I'm so grateful to um, be sharing a Zoom stage with you. It is such an honor. What I want to do is quickly go over some context of looking at anti-Semitic tropes that we've seen in the past and how they are being played out today uh, in the media, in political cartoons, on the far left, on the far right. Um, we'll look at America and some anti-Semitism that we're seeing on the far left and the far right, and then we will open it up. I have some questions for Dr. Berenbaum and Mr. Lesser, and then we'll open it up to your questions. So what I want to do now is share my screen and quickly look at anti-Semitism. And when you're looking at this picture, I think it does a pretty good job explaining anti-Semitism that we're seeing in America on the far left, on the far right. You have the Rothschilds, this idea that the Rothschilds, this Jewish family is responsible for every evil in the world. Um, I think you could say today that Soros would be the Rothschilds. You, of course, have Charlottesville in this context of Jews will not replace us, um, this idea of appropriating Nazi and anti-Semitic ideology into today's far right movements of white supremacy. Of course, you have the Tree of Life synagogue and the shooting there. Um, and then if we go to the left of the screen, we will see anti-Semitism coming from the far left. And a lot of times that anti-Semitism is disguised not in anti-Semitic language, but anti-Zionist language. And we'll talk about when something is legitimate criticism of the state of Israel or when it veers into anti Semitism. So, of course, the idea that Israel does not have a right to exist as a nation among nations, that is anti-Semitic. We will talk about what just happened recently in the past couple of weeks with a 500% increase in anti-Semitism worldwide, 80% in America. 
Um, so let's get on with this. So Dr. Berenbaum did a great job discussing a lot of anti-Semitism. I know in some ways I'm preaching to the choir, but let's just look at the rise of anti-Semitism and where this comes from. So we see a rise of anti-Semitism recently when we have economic uncertainty, a lack of confidence in democracy, an increased emphasis on racial and national identity. Of course, with the fading legacy of the Holocaust, which is why Mr. Lester and his story is so important, and he's such a treasure for us. This is what we've seen in the past couple of weeks, a deepening polarization between the political left and right over the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. Of course, ignorance of what anti-Semitism is, what is Jew hatred, and of course, and again, what we've seen in the past couple of weeks, it's Zenith, what they've called a pogrom on social media. The American Jewish Committee, who I'm the Associate Director of the LA chapter, um, did a survey and nine out of 10 people in 2020, American Jews believe that anti-Semitism is a problem. We see that 21% of non-Jews have never even heard the term anti-Semitism or aware of what it means. What are some sources of anti-Semitism and how are we seeing it played out today? We've seen this concept of deicide, the killing of God, which comes unfortunately from almost 2000 years of Christian theology. That idea has been recycled, and especially recycled in the Middle East. We saw it at a lot of the pro-Palestinian rallies recently in which it said, do not kill him twice. And what we're seeing today, um, especially on the far left, is that anti-Semitism, as I mentioned, is disguised in anti-Zionism. So Israel, in a sense, has become the collective Jew. So here we see the Israeli soldier killing a Palestinian. Um, and then, of course, this idea of being satanic. Louis Farrakhan refers to Jews as being satanic all the time, the temple of Satan. We see this concept of Jews being satanic coming out of the synoptic gospels. Um, we, we have heard Farrakhan say Hitler was a great man. Um, we have seen recently the ADL has said there has been 17,000 tweets that said Hitler was right recently. Um, and then down here, you see a political cartoon of Ariel Sharon as Satan, and this is in a newspaper out of Qatar. And then, of course, you get the blood libel, where Jews were, were accused of stealing Christian babies, using their blood in the Passover matzah, et cetera. And this picture was shared by a, a teacher for the United Nations Relief Work Agency, UNRWA, um, in which an Israeli is killing a Palestinian child and drinking its blood. There's lots of accusations of Israelis um, stealing Palestinian children and taking or using Palestinians um, and using their um, selling their lungs, et cetera. There's a lot of things out there that are, again, using the blood libel and of course, blaming it on and placing it on Israel. The poisoning of the well. Traditionally, we have seen and heard and read about this ridiculous context that Jews poisoned the well, Jews were responsible for the bubonic plague. And of course, we're seeing that anti-Semitic trope and canard being played out today with Jews um, spreading, starting COVID or Israel being responsible for COVID, Israel not um, treating Palestinians with COVID-19 or providing vaccinations for them or profiting off of the vaccine. And of course, the most notorious and anti-Semitic book, The Protocols of the Elders of Zion, which was written in Russia, permeated its way all over Europe, permeated its way all over the Middle East by the time the Nazis worked its way into the Middle East and Christian missionaries. So this is where we're getting a lot of that clannishness charge. Jews have dual loyalty, the blood libel, the idea that the Rothschilds and Jewish conspiracy theories are taking over the world, the media, money. Of course, the protocols were historically inaccurate, never written by Jews. By 1921, the Times of London did an expose, which said the protocols were absolutely false. And at that, time, at that point, Henry Ford spread it to America, and it permeated all over Europe and then later on to the rest of the world. We're seeing the way the protocols are seen today, even with graffiti, a very famous graffiti painting in London, a mural um, in which the protocols are depicted as Jews sitting around almost like a monopoly table um, on the backs of black indigenous people of color. And this by the way was spread and uh, loved by Jeremy Corbyn and he denied that this is in any way anti-Semitic. 
So when we're seeing these anti-Semitic tropes, we're seeing it on the right, for example, with the Proud Boys that have recently, um, in the past four or five years, really recently had a surge. We saw them a lot on January 6th. Um, with their t-shirts that said Camp Auschwitz, six million was not enough. And what makes them so difficult to, I mean, they're anti-Semites, they're misogynistic, they're homophobic, they're Islamophobic, racist in every way. But even if their leader, and this is what makes it so difficult, is an Afro-Cuban man, Enrique Torrio. And so this is when it becomes really difficult to place it exactly within the context of white supremacy, even though they are espousing white supremacist ideology. Then of course we have QAnon, Marjorie Taylor Greene, Flynn, um, Bobert, all of these people who believe, and again, this is where we're seeing these conspiracy theories come up, that Jews, entertainment, Hollywood, Soros are trafficking children and only Trump could um, save them. And a lot of anti-Semitic conspiracy theories of Jewish elitists, globalists, these cobbles are coming up with QAnon. And then we see anti-Semitism on the left, which is not as obvious and it's more insidious because it's not anti-Jewish, it's just anti-Zionist. But what does that mean? Zionism, the belief of Jewish self-determination, the belief that Jews are indigenous to the land of Israel. Anti-Zionism, denying that indigeneity, saying that all Jews are white, powerful oppressors, what we're seeing in the past couple of weeks on social media that has really led to the uptake of anti-Semitism in America and globally, this idea that Jews um, are ethnically cleansing, that they're white supremacists, colonizers in Israel, et cetera. So Israel, as I mentioned, has become, in a sense, the collective Jew. Now, instead of saying Jewish power, people say Zionist power. Instead of saying Jews control the banking, politicians, et cetera, now it's the Zionists, it's the Israeli lobby. Um, instead of saying Jews are the devil, now the Zionists are the devils, or the Zionists are the new Nazis, as we see in this political cartoon over here. And again, far left anti-Semitism disguised as anti-Semitism will say Jews are not indigenous to the Middle East, that Israel's an apartheid colonial state, that Jewish groups in Israel train American police, and thus Israel is responsible for police violence in America that Jews were responsible for the slave trade. This is something that you hear Farrakhan and the Nation of Islam say a lot, and I'll address that a little bit later. Um, that Jews in Israel lead American foreign policy, that they subjugate indigenous populations, as we saw in that mural. That Jews are white and privileged. I'm an Iranian Jew. Um, there's a lot of brown and black and Asian Jews. Israel's made up of 61% of brown and black Jews. And even Ashkenazi Jews, you cannot deny their um, being indigenous to the land of Israel. Um, all Jews are responsible for the actions of Israel, as we have seen in the past couple of weeks with the violence. They were not going around asking people if they're Zionists. They were going around asking people if they were Jewish, and that was enough for, um, for people to be violent towards them. And Israel denied a right to exist as a Jewish state. And again, in our survey, an overwhelming majority of Americans agree that anti-Zionism is anti-Semitism. Now, the question that we get a lot, and I think it's a very legitimate and fair question is, when is there legitimate criticism of Israel and when is criticism of Israel anti-Semitic? This is really important to point out. Criticizing Israel is not anti-Semitic. Jews do it all the time. Israelis do it all the time. It makes for a vibrant democracy. It leads into anti-Semitism when Israel is demonized, when it's delegitimized, and where there's double standards applied to the state of Israel. And those three Ds are a really good way of deciphering when something is legitimate criticism and, or when it leads into anti-Semitism. And what we're seeing is in, on the far left, progressive movements have basically told Jews that they have to leave their Zionism, whatever their Zionism is defined at, at the door in order to be a part of it. The Chicago Dyke March did not allow Jews to have a um, Jewish star on their flag, even though every other person was able to have their nationality, et cetera. The Women's March, as we know, um, Tamika Mallory, Linda Sarsour, Bob Land had to step down because of their anti-Semitism. A lot of intersectional movements will be anti-Zionist and thus tell Jews again, you can't be a part of our progressive movement if you believe that Jews have a right to live in the state of Israel. 
Then you have people who have made comments, again, picking up on anti-Semitic tropes. Jews have hypnotized the world. May Allah awaken the people to see the evil doing. Sorry, Israel has hypnotized the world. Um, it's all about the Benjamins, et cetera. Whether or not Congresswoman Omar was aware of these being anti-Semitic tropes, it does bring up a lot of anti-Semitism. And then the gaslighting of Jews. Just in March, the BBC had a panel discussing if Jews are a minority in Britain, and they decided to ask four people, none of whom are Jewish, to talk about the Jewish community. And then dismantling anti-Semitism, winning justice. This panel that we see here um, by people who have been accused of anti-Semitism and then tokenizing those who believe that Israel doesn't have a right to exist as a Jewish state and using them as if they are the majority of that void. Um, I am in academia. I have been a college professor for almost 20 years, and I cannot tell you how much I experience gaslighting by um, non-Jews in academia telling me what is and is not anti-Semitism. And let's just look at what has happened in the past two weeks. Just 10 minutes away from my house is Sushi Fumi where Jews were eating and dining out and people who claim to be pro-Palestinian, and I say claim because I don't believe and I want to make sure that I'm not, I, people don't think that I say people who are at these rallies are then responsible for the violence. There are certain few that have been literally finding diners who are Jewish. They didn't ask if they were Zionists, they just asked if they were Jewish and started attempting to beat them up. And then of course you had this man over here, this Orthodox Jew wearing a kippah being beaten up um, by those who espouse pro-Palestinian ideology, even though this has nothing to do and this does not in any way liberate Palestine. Of course, you have what happened in London the other day at a rally where people um, went to a Jewish community and yelled out that all Jewish mothers and daughters should be raped. And then in New York City, where they were throwing firecrackers at Jewish businesses and they scalded a woman's face. This has just been the past two and a half, three weeks with a 500% increase in anti-Semitism. And you saw this meme all over um, where it said, hey, leftist friends who are calling out the woman for her yellow, not vaccinated star. And that is a woman in Nashville who owns a hat shop, had stars of David, Jewish yellow stars, which said not vaccinated. Um, and, uh, appropriating the Holocaust in her anti-vax ideology. So it said, you called her out, bring that same energy to the people who are attacking random Jews in the name of Palestinian liberation, or the people at pro-Palestinian rallies waving Nazi flags and saying Hitler was right. As I mentioned, the ADL said in the past couple of weeks, there has been 17,000 tweets that said Hitler was right. Um, over here, you have someone like Tala Halawa, who is a reporter for the BBC who has tweeted Hitler was right. And then here you have a young grandson who celebrated his grandmother who survived the Holocaust on Twitter and asked, uh, sorry, on, um, on TikTok and asked people to send her a happy birthday. And then this was the response that she got all of this anti-Semitism. TikTok and definitely most of the social media platforms have a major anti-Semitism issue. And I just want to address this concept that um, Jews are responsible for the slave trade because you hear this all the time coming out of NOI, the Nation of Islam, et cetera. And this is just important to point out. Um, as I mentioned, Louis Farrakhan says this all the time. I have heard it come out of other people's mouths. The claim Jewish merchants dominated the Atlantic slave trade the truth is that the Jewish role in the slave trade was minimal. 1.25% of all Southerners, Jews who were Southerners owned slaves. And they owned slaves not because they were Jewish, but because they lived in the South. So the next time you hear that, and you heard Tamika Mallory from the Women's March say that, et cetera, um, you remember that number, 1.25. And then this, of course, from my favorite rabbi, Lord Jonathan Sachs, Jews cannot fight anti-Semitism alone. The victim cannot cure the crime. The hated cannot cure the hate. And this is why it's important. We build allies and we work together in order to spread the message of stopping anti-Semitism. So I will end here. And what I want to do is talk to Dr. Berenbaum and Mr. Lesser and ask them some questions. Sure. 
Um, and Mr. Lutcher, I'll start with you. What can we learn about the class that applies to this moment in time? You ask Dr. Birnbaum? Yes, I'm asking you, what can we learn about the past that affects us right now? And with what you're seeing today with anti-Semitism on the rise on both the left and the right, what can we learn well, from this? What we should do is start teaching, um, not just teaching, because we don't want the kids to grow up as educated Eichmanns. Um, you have to teach them to be loving children, respect of others, and that there's no difference. You cannot discriminate one nationality against another one. We are all God's creation, and we should have the right to live side by side and appreciate our differences rather than hate them. So it all comes down to education and it's the right kind of education. And I'm working very hard to get a um, level type of education throughout the United States. Um, we were su successful in Nevada and uh, Nevada voted for teaching all history, not just Jewish history, Black history, Indian history, all history. You cannot pick and choose whatever you want. Well, that passed in Nevada. I would like to see something like this national. Every school should teach about history. You don't go to talk about World War II and skip the Holocaust. It's part of history. You don't talk about what happened to the black people because this state doesn't like to bring it up. No, it's part of history. And everything that has to do with history should be taught in all the schools throughout the nation. And this is my answer. And we're doing everything possible to do it. I'm happy that I was able to budge one state, the states that I live in, and we were successful, and they just passed a week ago, said they're going to teach everything about the Holocaust. So not just the Holocaust, everything about history, good or bad, it has to be taught. It could not be deleted. So that's what I'm, I feel, uh, that the right kind of education to educate the kids to be loving children and not to hate, because I do know that most of the hatred begins in their homes. The kids hear it from their parents or from friends. And before you know it, they repeat it, and then it, it, it sort of contaminates the whole area, the whole neighborhood. This has Thank to- Thank you so much. Thank, thank you. you so, so much. And thank you for all that you do. Dr. Berenbaum, how would you let me, answer that let me question? Let me challenge um, our presentations a little bit. I think we're being overly bleak. Um, let me begin with something we have to say, which is that if you look at the data, and there's very interesting data, Judaism is the single most popular religion in America. Now, before we take a sense of pride in that, let's say that the reason for that is we are the least hated of all the religions in America. Example, the Roman Catholic Church is divided between pew and, um, and altar. Uh, the priest scandal has been enormously taxing on the Roman Catholic Church and even church teaching because Roman Catholics get abortions, have divorces, and practice birth control in the same identical fashion in which the rest of the population does. Protestantism is divided between evangelical and mainstream, and evangelical is divided between the younger and the older generation. My kid's generation does not see anything different, whether evangelical or not, does not see much difference between 
uh, somebody who is gay and somebody who is left-handed. Uh, people have been taught for a generation to discuss Islam and nobody understands Eastern religion. Consequently, all the data indicates that the Jews are the most popular religion, meaning the most respected, the least disrespected. Second thing is that less Americans are anti-Semitic today as a percentage of the population than ever before. Why then is anti-Semitism on the rise? And you said it, Saba. It's on the rise for two reasons. Number one is because the internet is a megaphone. And consequently, if you feel anti-Semitic, you can express it. Number two, they can no longer be quarantined. 30 years ago, 40 years ago, your organization would have advocated quarantining anti-Semitism, put it to the side, because give it social isolation and it will wither on the vine. Today, social support networks give legitimacy to hatred, and we borrow one form of hatred from another. Example, uh, um, Syracuse University had racial and anti-Semitic uh, incidents, uh, not last fall, but fall before last. And all of a sudden, somebody dropped the manifesto from the, um, uh, the, the tirade from the New Zealand killer in the library on everybody's cell phone. So again, you get the spreading of it in a dramatic way. Secondly, with regard to Islam, we have some good news. And I could not have said this a year ago. The good news is that Sunni Islam is in a strategic alliance with Israel against Shia Islam. This is an, an alliance of the elite that has yet to transport itself down to the street. And the moment if, and it's the equivalent of um, uh, when do parents tell the kids that they're, divor that they're getting divorced? Because the moment you tell the population that all the anti-Semitic of it you have reinforced for a generation is no longer the case because they trust Israel with a nuclear weapon more than they trust Iran. And remember, Saudi Arabia has been one of the great financiers of this entire terrain now, uh, and Saudi Arabia needs the shelter uh, of, of the Israelis. So uh, the situation is not out of control. What is problematic today is that hatred, first of all, we have multiple crises. We have an economic crisis, a health crisis, a judicial, a, a justice crisis. We have a, uh, some would say a climate crisis. I would agree with that. So we have multiple crises which lead to insecurity and conspiracy theories and the world is changing. But what is different today is that if you feel hatred, it's regarded as a badge of authenticity to express it. In the last century, when I was growing up, anti-Semites did not express their anti-Semitism because they were afraid to be identified with the cruelties of Nazism. Racists were afraid to be identified with the bull Connors of what was happening down south. Today, if you feel hatred, you express hatred, badge of authenticity and the like, and consequently there are, are um, few restraints. Now. Clearly, one of the things we saw over the last two weeks poses a dramatic uh, problem for the left who want to say that you can be anti-Israel but not anti-Semitic because the, critiques, the critics of Israel have expressed themselves by attacking all Jews as if attacking the Jew next door solves the Palestinian, the Palestinian issue. And let's also say that there is legitimate criticism of Israel I, for example, am less disturbed by what, what keeps me up at night is not what happened in Gaza, but what happened in the various pogroms, pogroms against Jews and pogroms by Jews against Muslims in the streets of Israeli cities, especially mixed cities, including, by the way, um, within, um, within Jerusalem. Our audience, but let me stop, but our audience has asked to uh, respond to their questions and we should turn to them if we can Saba now. Okay, thank you so much. Um, 
So this is a question that I also get all the time, and this has to do with this concept of anti-Semitism. And why do we use this term anti-Semitism? Because a lot of times people will say, I can't be an anti-Semite, I'm a Semite, um, which is historically doesn't make any sense. But the question is, why not just replace the word anti-Semitism with Jew hatred? Look, one of the reasons we scholars have changed the spelling of anti-Semitism is because the claim was made, uh, number one, there is no such thing as Semitism. And the other is Arabs claimed that they could not be anti-Semites because they were Semites. So we spell anti-Semitism, A-N-T-I-S-E-M-I-T-I-T-I-S-M, without a hyphen, without a capital, without a capital at the beginning or at the end. Uh, Jew hatred is a legitimate way of speaking about it, but we should also distinguish between anti-Judaism, which is a religious uh, versus anti-Semitism or anti-Jew, which is not religious. And part of what we also should say with part of the good news, and I, I wanna stress it because I, I think the community is a little bit more anxious than it has to be. And there was a great leader of the American Jewish Committee by the name of Milton Himmelfarb, who half a century ago said the easiest way to get booed by a Jewish audience is tell them that anti-Semitism is less severe a problem than they think it is. Uh, but let's go back and, and say, when we go back to Christianity, Christianity has been transformed before our eyes. Pope John, St. John the 23rd, St. Uh, John, uh, St. John Paul the second ended the idea of Jews uh, being responsible for killing Christ. John Paul said anti-Semitism is anti-Christian. He apologized for the anti-Semitism of Christians, not of Christianity, and prayed at the Western Wall, the first bishop of Rome to walk into a synagogue of Rome. And just two years ago, the current Pope, Pope Francis, ended the idea that there needs to be a mission to the Jews. The second thing that fell was communism, which was deeply, deeply, deeply supportive of anti-Semitism and in, an infrastructure of anti-Semitism was supported by that. We're now seeing in Eastern Europe where communism fell and for a while democracy, pluralism and tolerance came in. We're seeing in Eastern Europe that nationalism has taken an anti-Semitic form we see that in Hungary, we see that in Poland. We also see a rewriting of the history of the Holocaust to uh, cleanse them of their deeds that's taken place. So there is good news, there is bad news. Less people are anti-Semitic today than they were before, but they are more heard from, more active, more free to act. And that's one of the reasons we have, and, and the other thing I'd have to say is I'm angry now, I think Jews are timid. And that is, um, give you um, a, a couple of examples. We had a case at USC where the president of the student body, the incoming president of the student body was attacked for being a Zionist, so she ended up resigning. Hell, Jews need to have a tougher skin and fight it out. Even somebody who's written as good a book as Barry Weiss did on anti-Semitism was on the editorial board of the New York Times, felt under the attack for her pro-Jewish views. She ended up resigning instead of sitting there and either getting fired or fighting it out. Jews have to be proud to be Jews and we have to be aggressive about it. And we achieved freedoms in my generation in the 60s 70s and 80s to be Jews in public. And we can't, we can't either internalize the hatred that is addressed to us, nor fail to avail ourselves of the freedom that are still available in the United States. And we need to be tougher and more thick skinned than we were before. You know, I, can I just add to that as also someone who works with a lot of students I'm um, in the case of Rose Rich at USC. Um, you know, I see a lot of my pro-Zionist students 
it's exhausting for them. And at the end of the day, we have to remember they're 20, 21 years old, and they're just trying to finish finals, figure out what they're doing with their life. And they have this burden placed on them of, um, you know, a lot of times I have one student at a university, at a college right outside of LA, who has to make the college fair with anti-Semitism because they will not address it. They will not talk about it. They will, you know, and so she has this burden of having to, um, having to almost have another job, which is the job that the university should be doing, which is condemning anti-Semitism and stuff. So I think a lot of times it, we're asking of our students a lot. Now, Barry Weiss is a whole other issue. She's getting paid for this. This is, she's an adult, but you know, it's, it's the mental health of our Zionist students for being bullied by their professors, their TAs and other students on social media, um, on campus. It is a lot and it's, it's, it's unfair for them to have to deal with all of this. My heart really goes out to them. Um, Mr. Lester, I have a question for you. Sure. You know, and, uh, and uh, Michael, of course, please answer this too as a scholar of the Holocaust. How do we teach about the Holocaust to younger students without sugarcoating it, but yet not giving them anxiety about it? How do you go about doing that? <clears throat> it's almost impossible. You, I don't believe in sugarcoating it uh, or painting a rosy picture. You can't. The Holocaust was so terrible. Uh, you can't. The only thing I can do is maybe not teach young kids. But once they're in their teens, um, I'm sorry, that, that's what happens. That's what happens. You cannot sugarcoat it. I, I have never done it, but I will refuse sometimes uh, speaking in a fifth grade because I don't want to leave the kids with nightmares. But uh, I can't I can't minimize what really happened. Thank you, Dr. Yes, Barenbaum. Look, I, I don't think we should traumatize people by overemphasizing the Holocaust, but we have to tell the truth to those who study it. And we can't, um, we, we, we have to also understand that, um, you know, uh, there was a, let me put it to this way, there was an interesting um, petition by um, the Martian Living and the first draft was to speak about all the anti-Semitic uh, incidents and to say um, um, history is repeating itself. And I wrote to them and said, no, 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 we can't say history is repeating uh, itself. We have to say something very different, which is we can't allow history to repeat itself. This is not 1933, it's not 1938. Um, you heard in the Holocaust Museum's um, 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 video that the leaders of governments are speaking out strong, the leaders of governments in the West are speaking out strongly against anti-Semitism. It's coming from other sources in society and it's coming from the crises that are being felt. We have to make sure that cannot go mainstream. This is the problem of the, uh, the, the um, uh, uh, QAnon uh, type of phenomenon on the right. It's uh, the fact that you even had, uh, you know, this Congresswoman Marjorie Taylor uh, Greene speaking about uh, the Jewish star, the gold star, as if Jews were given a gold star. And then talking about the 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 uh, way in which um, uh, uh, vaccination is is somehow reminiscent of of the Holocaust, we can't allow it to go mainstream, and we can't allow the left. Now let's also say something else, which should give Jews confidence: we are empowered. The problem in the world today is, in, is that there's a gap between the perception of Jews and the self-perception of Jews. Israel regards itself as besieged by hostile armies on all of its sides. It is perceived as 
a regional military superpower and an economic marvel. And it is. It has disproportionate power to any of its neighbors. And with all the horror of the rockets, and I don't diminish them for one moment, they're the equivalent of biting the ankles of Israel. Jews in the United States are regarded as a privileged part of the white majority, and that's one of the reasons why it's only when anti-Semitism becomes violent, kills, attacks, manifest in the most extreme that anybody will begin to condemn anti-Semitism because we are regarded as privileged parts of the white majority, not understanding that we have black Jews, not understanding that we have poor Jews. And consequently, we have to use our power and not be embarrassed to use our power. So that's a difference that is radical between the history of the past and the history of today. And we have to avail ourselves of that. And if we're accused of being powerful, there is no um, virtue in powerlessness. There's often desperation. We've experienced powerlessness and we understand that powerlessness invite, invites victimization. Power provides opportunity. Opportunity should be used wisely and intelligently. Thank you. We have another question regarding anti-Zionism and anti-Semitism. I talked about anti-Zionism as being anti-Semitic, that denying Jewish self-determination and indigeneity to the land of Israel, in my opinion, is anti-Semitic. Do either of you want to answer that? Because you have groups like If Not Now or Jewish Voice for Peace that claim that um, they're Jewish, but they are not Zionist. Let's, 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 let's confront that really. There are forms of Zionism in Israel that are problematic. And the forms of Zionism that, in Israel that are problematic. Look, um, the Kahanist wing uh, that got elected to the Knesset is racist. I knew Marty Cahan. I knew Marty Cahan when he was living with a non-Jewish woman and was not as pious as he came. I knew him when he lived with a non-Jewish woman who committed suicide. So I, I go back with Mayor Kahana for um, a, a long, long generation. There are racist Zionists who see the capture of the land as indispensable to Jewish determination. And when I had a conversation years ago with Mayor Kahana, I said, you know, you have a problem. If you're a minority and you push without restraint for the expression of minority rights, at some point, the majority society will tell you where to get off. If you are a majority and you go to Israel and you push for Jewish rights to the exclusion of other rights, then there's nobody to stop you and that's where you become dangerous. Declaration of Independence declared equal rights for all the citizens of Israel. And that is a declaration. We know that uh, the American Declaration of Independence was an aspiration rather than an achievement. And Israel has not achieved equal rights. And there is a tension, and I believe in a Jewish state, but there's a tension at the core between the idea of a Jewish state that is respected of and respectful for the rights of minorities who live within that state. That's got to be dealt with. And some elements of Zionism have no idea that the expression of the Jewish state must recognize also the fact that there are citizens of Israel who have rights of citizenship, defensive citizenship. That's what happens in the Supreme Court every single week where the Supreme Court tries to balance that expression of rights. So it's a form of Zionism that may be problematic and Jewish self-determination this was a great achievement of the Jewish people in the 20th century, a miraculous achievement in the 20th century, came too late for some, for most Jews, but is an essential achievement. That's not the same thing as Jewish domination over other people and the abrogation of their rights and the negation of their reality.
Thank you so much, Dr. Barenbaum. Mr. Lester, would you like to answer that regarding anti-Zionism and anti-Semitism? In my opinion, they're both the same. I, I don't distinguish between one another because it's just an excuse. Oh, I'm not anti-Semitic, I'm anti-Israel. Um, that's only an excuse in my opinion. And no, I don't see any difference between one or the other. Because you'll find usually the person who is anti-Israel is also is anti-Semitic. He may not admit it, but in his actions and everything, he is uh, on the side of uh, anti-Semite. So I believe it's one of the same thing. Let me because add one other word, uh, Ben. You know, um, the Jewish people have now have now decided in their infinite wisdom that the future of the Jewish people is going to be lived significantly. A plurality and soon a majority is going to be lived in Israel. So one of the dangers you have is in one of the things you have to be careful of if your quotation marks anti-Zionist and you say you're not anti-Jewish, you're essentially saying I'm opposed to the form that Jews have chosen for their own future. And every people is entitled to choose their own future provided they don't violate other people. Now let's let's go back to a, a point you made, um, Saba, that's very important. Double standards. If you say Israel has no right to exist because it occupies territory that other people occupied first, then you'd have to say that about the United States, Canada, and Australia, among a few other countries, many other countries. So you're judging Israel by a standard different than any other. If you're saying Israel has to begin to recognize the people who were there in larger numbers than the Israelis, and over the 19th and 20th century, the Jews did come back home what they viewed as home and what the Palestinians and the Arabs viewed as a settlement, a colonial settlement, you say Israel has to recognize those rights. Then you also say that that's what Australia tries hard to do. That's what Canada tries hard to do. That's what the United States, at least some of us try to do. And that's always a tension within society, but it's not a reason why that can't be the form of the future. So. If the Jews have decided that the future of the Jewish people is going to be resting in significant numbers in the state of Israel, then anybody who wants a Jewish future has to respect that future. Now, we can struggle as to what that form of the state of Israel should be, and I certainly have opinions as to that, but I also have opinions of what form the United States should be. And most of the time, I'm, not, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm certainly not in a majority. Yeah. Thank you. Um, another and question. Last is oh, we yeah. have to go back to Ben's thing, and this is what makes the Holocaust survivors so wonderful. Holocaust survivors have been preaching a fundamental value that all human beings are created in the image of God and they have to be respected in the particularity of their humanity. It doesn't get more basic than that and it doesn't get more important than that. Very true. That's what I believe in. You, you, you articulated it. And I don't want to hate, uh, hide my Judaism. I'm wearing Zachor pins all over me. And I gave out over a million of these pins to listeners. Too bad, you know, I can't do it over TV with Zoom. But my dream is to see six million Jewish people wear this the Zahor pin to remember there was a Holocaust. Then then I, I I'll feel that I had a life that matters. It made a difference. And this is my goal. I'm trying to get as many people not to hide their Ju Judaism because there is anti-Semitism, just the opposite. Show it, show it. The Nazis made us wear Star of David as a ban of, banner of shame. 
that's where this is a banner of pride. I mean, this is the way I feel. And I'm sorry, I feel the same way, whether a, a person who claims he is only against Israel, but he's not against anti-Semitism. I don't believe there is a difference. This is my opinion. Thank you. I have another question. Um, you know, recently we've really been discussing the Ashkenazi normative aspect of Judaism in America, meaning the focus on Ashkenazi Jews and really um, not celebrating the voices of Sephardi, Mizrahi, Black, Asian Jews. Um, but it has been recently with everything that has happened in America that we are acknowledging these voices and the importance and significance of Jews from other communities. How can we use the voices of, um, of all Jews in order to combat anti-Semitism. And my other question that a lot of people ask is how do we, what can we do collectively to combat anti-Semitism? Let's go back to Rabbi Sachs's uh, statement. Anti-Semitism is not primarily a Jewish problem. It's the problem of um, those who are anti-Semitic. It's the problem of Christian society, of Muslim society. Uh, I see a good deal of question about the nature of, of, of um, uh, black anti-Semitism in the, in the United States. We also had a question about uh, the idea that the more educated uh, blacks are, the more anti-Semitic they are. I think that that research is fundamentally out of date. And the question is not asked in a subtle enough way. There's been a dramatic change over the last uh, years, it relates directly in the black community to uh, essentially how alienated they become from the United States and from American norms with regard to uh, education. Let's also point out one other thing with, uh, in response to Pittsburgh. The most important thing that happened in response to Pittsburgh is not to see the event but to see the response to the event. Number one, civility held. The governor, the mayor, the district attorney, the police commissioner were all there and say, we don't want this in our community. Pittsburgh Steelers wore a Jewish star. The Pittsburgh uh, Penguins wore a Jewish star. The World Series was stopped for a moment of silence for the victims. Mrs. Rogers, the widow of Fred Rogers, who was one of the great moral leaders of America, who taught, as Ben does, the most fundamental values of American life, and who went against racism by inviting a, 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 an African American who was walking into his little um, uh, community to put his feet in the pool with him and showed kids that one swims together and then what doesn't do that. They came out. The second thing that happened, which is um, equally, which is extraordinary, is the Muslim community gave a quarter of a million dollars to uh, help repair the Tree of Life synagogue, which says that the Muslims all of a sudden learned in America, even if you think they're faking it, they learned that interreligious civility that the idea that, uh, that freedom of religion in America means freedom for religion and freedom for all religion, that it was essential that you demonstrate solidarity. And Jews have returned the favor when mosques have been attacked. So that becomes essential to it. And civility holding into community holding and the community joined together to march against such incivility. That's also what happened in France. You had the entire leaders of Europe. Let's look at the response to the hyper The entire leadership of Europe, presidents and prime ministers, marched down the Champs-Élysées against anti-Semitism, something that could, did not happen, would not happen, could not happen a generation or two before. And the president of France said what? France without its Jews is not France. That's essentially the most important way in which you stamp it out. 
not by exacerbating hatred, but by saying we don't want the haters to win. And that means people of goodwill, people who believe that all people are created with human dignity and human rights and human and, 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 and entitled to human respect. All people have to be treated that way. And that's essentially what has to happen in response. What do we do with regard to anti-Semitism? Number one, we continue in relations with all elements of the American community. Number two, we express who we are, we express solidarity, and we express the most fundamental of all values, which is the idea that we are created equally and we're entitled to what? Respect for life and liberty. And I'm less convinced about the pursuit of happiness, but life and liberty are surely absolutely important. And, uh, and we embrace those collective values in solidarity with one another. And we try to also, I think in this society, and this is where you'll forgive a political thing, I think Joe Biden being boring is absolutely fabulous. And Israel just elected uh, um, uh, uh, as its new president, Isaac Herzog, and the accusation in, in some of the places is Isaac Herzog is also boring. Tone it down, quiet it down, a little bit of normalcy, a little bit of decency, a little bit of stability, and a little bit of human solidarity and empathy will do us an awful lot of good at this moment. So I think one of the reasons Joe Biden got elected is precisely because he's born. And that, that ironically made it attractive and precisely because he's not innately a hater. And I think we have to tone down all of this hatred and the way to do the way the, the, and that will help us stabilize the situation. And also uh, hopefully we will get out of the medical crisis and get out of the economic crisis. And then we can deal with the rest of the crises in our society. But again, if you attack a person's life, which is, which is health and ability to protect his or her family, which is uh, economic, you certainly have instability in society. Thank you so much to both of you, Dr. Berenbaum, Mr. Lesser. I'm going to hand it over to Robin now. Robin. Can't hear oh, you. Robin, you're uh, on. Technical difficulties. <laughs> Sabi, you had you had uh, asked a question to um, Ben and Michael in regards to how to teach children. Can you just re remind me of that question again? Yes, the question was, how do you teach children about the Holocaust um, and tell them about it historically without creating a sense of anxiety in them about the horrors of it? I love that question, and um, and I know that from my grandfather's experience being a Holocaust survivor, he's trying to shield the young. But as a mother of two young boys um, who are four generation Holocaust survivors, we do have to tread lightly about the subject, but not to dismiss it. Kids are so intuitive. They're perceptive. They know much more than the parents would ever think, even at a young age. So hiding our history um, will only, in my opinion, cause anxiety and worry, and in turn cause fear and insecurity, uh, specifically in regards to their heritage. And we need to teach them pride about our past, our faith, our heritage, where we come from. And part of that is learning the differences of what our family and our ancestors had gone through, had died for. Um, and it's to continue telling the message. Just say it lightly. You can talk about what had happened in the past without the gory parts. You can read about it 
and there are books about it, but without the gory parts, because you don't want to fear the kids. Um, I mean, my kids are nine and going on six. Six is really young, but my six-year-old knows um, somewhat of what happened, but without the worry. Um, so as a mother, I do suggest that we do need to talk about it because it is part of who we are and how we could not repeat and we don't want to instill that fear that they wouldn't be proud being Jewish. Robin, let me add two uh, very brief sentences. Number one, the most important thing that we can teach kids at this point, which was a lie when Ben was a kid. And that is that number one, um, we can, t the easiest, the, the most important message we can communicate to young kids is that the world is safe and we're here to protect you. Mm -hmm. For Ben, that was an absolute lie. Growing up, his parents could not say that and, 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 and the like. They could say it in the world before, but they couldn't say it once 1939 developed. And in fact, that, that's the most important. The other thing is we have to teach them the joy of being Jewish. Mm -hmm. Not, how, not that people died for it, but that people lived for it. And if they experience joy and pride and values and nobility out of being Jewish, then they can take the price that is paid in order to defend those values. I couldn't agree more with you, Michael. I, I didn't uh, think we would disagree. Yeah, no, I, and that was beautifully, that's beautifully said. And I know that Kiyomi is um, gonna talk to you about a few things about how we're able to go ahead and bring these discussions into um, our communities because we should continue thank talking you. about this. Kiyomi. Yes, thank you so much, Robin. I know we're a couple minutes over here, but I just wanted to um, thank these incredible panelists. Dr. Saba Sumek, you held it down, my friend. Um, I'm in such uh, appreciation and awe of you all the time. Um, Dr. Michael Berenbaum, it was a pleasure working with you and hearing you for the first time tonight. And um, Holocaust survivor um, and Zahor uh, Holocaust Remembrance Foundation, uh, Ben Lesser, thank you all the time for telling your story and, and, and continuing Lador Vador so that we never forget. Um, Look, the, the work we all do to eradicate, um, to educate um, in this effort to um, combat anti-Semitism is incredible. And I, and I see that here tonight. There was so much more um, here than we could even um, hope for, for in this program. And we covered a lot of history from um, anti-Semitism yesterday and how it looks today. Um, it's critical that we understand what we are combating if we are going to effectively eradicate anti-Semitism. So I wanna thank um, Holocaust, um, Zahor Holocaust Remembrance Foundation, AJC and USD Kazan Institute and also Valley Outreach Synagogue for co-sponsoring this event. Um, Rabbi Lee Paz stands behind all of our social justice efforts and this is just one of, of many. Um, I also wanna thank our attendees. Um, Again, there were a lot of really thoughtful questions. It was a lively uh, Q&A, and so we couldn't get to all of them, but I want you all to look for uh, more opportunities to engage in deeper conversations where we can actually engage each other and, um, and challenge and, and ask questions to, of each other in real time. Um, so the Valley Outreach Synagogue Against Anti-Semitism Task Force will be providing opportunities soon for us to engage more deeply in these really important discussions. So I wanna thank everyone tonight. Thank you, Robin, chair of the Against Anti-Semitism Task Force. I couldn't have picked a, a better chair. I appreciate you and good night, everyone. Thank you so much, everybody. Good night. Bye. Nice.